Okay, here we go. Welcome to this, another episode of Writer's Chat. We're so glad you're here. And we have most of our usual suspects. We have Melissa Stroh and Brandy Bro, and I'm Norma Poor. And here on Writer's Chat, we talk about everything writerly because like our motto says, it's more fun to talk about it than sometimes to actually do it. Welcome, so glad you're here. Today, we're gonna talk about our writing space and maybe how it's morphed over the years. And we might even sprinkle in a little bit of some famous writing desks if time allows. So welcome and let's go ahead and, and kick this off. Um, I guess we can kind of start this out maybe a little bit of an interview style. So um, I'll be your co-host today and um, let's let's go ahead and get started. I will put our um, co-hosts in the hot seat first and then whoever else wants to jump in, please feel free. And I think I'll go ahead and start with you, Brandy, if that's oh, okay. Oh boy, <laughs> sure. <laughs> Tell me, how has your, or has, your writing space changed since you very first began writing? Ah, oh, boy. Well, I have to say most of my writing spaces have been in my bedroom. <laughs> uh, you know, I think a lot of writers start off, they need to carve out a spot and where do they usually do it? Usually in the corner of their bedroom somewhere. Sometimes it's the living room, but often there's not space. So I was really lucky. I had this beautiful, huge, big desk. It was one of those things that uh, would have been a great refinishing project. I kind of wish that I had done it, but we had moved um, to a really tiny house and I didn't have space for this desk. I had to give it away. And I still some days lament that I don't have it. It had pull out drawers on the side that you could put extra papers, like I need a place to put extra papers. Um, the only thing that wasn't great was that, you know, it was just one space. It didn't have a keyboard drawer. So it was always kind of not ergonomical. Um, but I still love that. And I have to say probably more, more than what has changed in my writing space has probably been my writing computers. The first thing that I started writing with was one of those big, old window things that you had to boot up with a 3.5 floppy disk <laughs> and it had green type that's really pixelated and that was all you got black and green on the screen um and I was really really young back then I found this computer in a in a used uh place I don't know I think it was a consignment shop or something and I bought it for 400 bucks which was probably super overpriced but I didn't know anything about computers at that time so yeah uh, that's kind of where it's been I've had uh, my my I've had an array of desks uh usually in you know my bedroom um at one point we have we have many many people in our family and at one point we were in a trailer and we had one kid that was born and that was just one too many for this trailer. My husband had to put on an addition, which gave us a huge bedroom. Uh, and I got to put my desk on half that. So I kind you know, I had like an office space on half my, my uh, bedroom. And now, now I have my own office space. The only caveat is that I have a storage room off of my office space and that's where all the food is. So guess who comes in and out of my, office every day I'm trying to work all the rest of the kids and the family want to go get food out of the freezer or the shelf yeah so that's kind of how my writing space has changed um it's always really kind of been inside and most of the time it's been tethered to a desktop uh and I prefer to uh write I guess more on a desktop than a laptop because I like screen real estate and so I can have bigger monitors and be able to see and that's especially important for me when I'm editing and I need to have a style sheet up and the manuscript up and then editorial notes up I need space so that's kind of how things have changed over the years it's been mostly bedrooms a little bit I've shared offices I've shared office with my dad for a while when we were staying at his place so I'd have my desk in his office and um, but it's it's kind of been rather boring how my spaces have changed. But I do prefer to write indoors than outdoors, even though I love the outdoors. Um, 
the outdoors tends to distract me too much. <laughs> I don't actually write very much. I sit there and I enjoy the sun and the breeze and half the time I can't see my screen. Although I hear that um, our resident writer, Rachel, has a great setup for outdoor writing with some kind of collapsible box or something that she's devised that she can actually see her screen outside. I'm going to have to do something like that somewhere along the way, I think. <laughs> anyway, back to you, Norma. That's great. And it's funny how when we think back to um, where it all began, so to speak, or where we first got serious about writing, a lot changes. Um, and not just how we write, but often where we write and what it looks like. And Melissa, I'm going to pass that question on to you. Tell us a little bit about how your writing space has changed over the years. Well, okay, I'm going to share this like I do my own writing. I'm totally pantsing this. So <laughs> um, as a high schooler, I didn't have my own computer. So I wrote everything in notebooks. And um, that was kind of when I first had the writing bug was back then, although I, you know, kind of got discouraged from it and lost the, the dream to pursue it during high school. So um, I'd write on notebooks, but any finished stories, you know, by that time, we actually did have good old Microsoft works and the clippy. And uh, <laughs> so I, I didn't always have to type on the black and green screen, although I did have some forays in that back in the day, too when I was a kid, but um, yeah, so I would uh, type finished products out on a, somebody else's computer and print them. <laughs> but uh, by the time that uh, I was in uh, Bible college, uh, my husband had a computer and I would use his. And eventually we uh, saved up enough money that I was able to get one of those nice little Dell laptops, <laughs> those clunky things that were not reliable and I discovered on that the very first time just how detrimental it was not to save <laughs> to backups on the discs. <laughs> yes, we had to use the discs back then. Of course, we transitioned from the floppies to the hards to the laser discs. And uh, yeah, I didn't and my Dell crashed and all of my research and writing that was on it and unsaved was gone. But um, back in the, those days, we uh, had gone back and forth between an apartment in uh, Bible College and my husband's family ranch. We lived in the little original homestead house there. So it was a pretty small little house. And most of the time, my uh, office with my Dell computer was our, our living room couch. And I kept my uh, laptop on my lap where I used a TV tray to type from. And that was, that was it. So my, my office was pretty mobile once I had my laptop. And uh, so I just transitioned from different laptops over the years. And, but usually always found myself venturing back to the couch <laughs> to type away. And when kids came along, that was a convenient place too, as long as I could keep them from clambering all over the laptop, because then it was easy transition to take care of the kids, get back to writing, always writing in snatches of time, because there was never long periods until bedtime when you actually got them to fall asleep. And then I wrote into the night. And that was most of my my writing life was homeschooling the kids by day and writing by night, um, which is kind of fun. Norma, she's smiling because she knows by the time that we got around it to the uh, 2000 teens, well, 2015, 2016, they joined Jerry Jenkins Guild and they had a group in the chat there called uh, Moms by Day, Writers by Night. And so it was just it was destiny, I tell you joined joined that group and met Norma and a bunch of other writing friends and and yeah we we shared and and all those fun things but yeah eventually I did get a desk and it was in our homeschooling classroom and so again I still didn't get to do much writing by day because my computer was also my homeschool command central so running the kids on their their schoolwork and still writing by nighttime but now I venture back and forth between the couch and the desk and still have a laptop that's great Randy I thought of something um it's good to think of something when you're a writer uh, <laughs> True. um you know for some reason you know I've been working on computers for such a long time but I completely disregarded when I was really really young because I really actually first started writing when I was a child um, and I would write, you know, poems and stories. Uh, my mom had 
um, a typewriter and I was just so enamored with that typewriter and I'd set it on the dining room table and just start typing. And um, at the time I really wasn't really great with um, my own creativity and I decided I wanted to write about planets. So I took out a, a book that was all about planets and I ended up pretty much just plagiarizing the book in this, uh, my own edited version of planets. And I just kind of rearranged the, the wording, a little editor at heart, I guess. Um, and then um, there was another one, a story that I came up with that I got the idea of based off a Disney story. And I just typed that up. Um, but, you know, it got me thinking about, you know, the only reason I got that first computer is because I had started work on a book that never went anywhere, but I started work on a book and I realized that I was having troubles moving things around and I was just about tearing my hair out because everything was on paper and how can you move words on paper? I'm like, I need a computer so I can cut and paste. And that was really that moment of transition from being just, you know, a, a, a hobby writer to really wanting to do something more with it needing to move chunks of text and not being able to do that with pen and paper um so I think you know that's um you talk about like the writing desk and the writing space but then there's also that aspect of the writing tools and how those change over the years along with the writing desk when you have a new need um you know even like you know at one point I was just had a desktop and I realized I needed a laptop so that I could be mobile and be able to work on stuff outside of the house. You know, things change like that in that respect. So I just kind of wanted to add that. But Norma, I would love to hear about you and your writing spaces and how that has changed over the years. Well, I'm glad you mentioned typewriters because now I don't feel quite so old. <laughs> and the first, um, I remember the very first time I had to, to write a book report, um, my mom had picked up a, a manual typewriter. And for those of you that don't know what that is, that's this little square thing. And you have to hit each key really hard to make it, to make the key slam against the paper. And it, it had a ribbon and, oh, it was just so much fun. And then by the time I was in high school, I took a class that because electric typewriters were the the new thing and they were like really big and bulky and the and printers really weren't a thing except in big offices because it was this ginormous machine on papers that just um you know ran forever and ever and ever and you would just they were perforated and you would tear them but anyway fast forward many decades and um when i first met melissa on Jerry Jenkins Guild was when um, God finally said, okay, you're finished raising kids and now it's time to um, give you your heart's desire and start to write. And, and so I would sit at the dining room table. Um, it would just kill my, kill my back because the, it, as the term Brandy used, it wasn't ergonomically good for me. So I started, um, Pinterest was a thing by now. And I started looking at small office, small house offices. And there was a thing called a clothis. Have any of you ever heard of a clothis? Well, if you haven't, it's where you take a closet in your house and you turn it into an office, a clothis. So we, I had, we happened to have a small closet in our bedroom and, um, we emptied it. I, we were just using it for storage. So we emptied that out and I put my first laptop up there and I didn't have a printer yet, but I did have my laptop and um, it was just, it was my office and I was so excited. I strung up pretty little lights so it would shine down just right on the, on the keyboard. <clears throat> Excuse me. And so that was where my official writing journey began. And now um, that not only are all my kids grown, but all but one is actually out of the house. We're an almost empty nester. Um, not sure if we'll ever be completely an empty nester, but who knows? And it's okay. Um, but now one of the bedrooms is my office and I have this big, beautiful corner desk and I've got shelves and I've got a printer and got a place to hit set my light so everything is great and um 
Yeah, it's, it's changed over the years. And I love having a place where I can go and just shut the door. And even when I had my coffice, it was nice. But I found myself, because it really was a little, think of like um, a linen closet. It was about that size. So it was little or a coat closet at the top of the stairs kind of thing. So I, you know, I'd either have to sit way back with my arms out like this, which again, ergonomically wasn't the best, or I'd sit just a little bit scrunched up. But I was so happy just to have my own writing space. It was okay. So when my daughter moved out, I took over her bedroom and that became my office. And I too remember my first computer and as soon, Brandy, as soon as she started talking about floppy disk instantly, that AOL landline connection started ringing in my head. <laughs> I'm sure many of you remember the dial-up connection sound. And um, yeah, so we started with that. And then um, uh, I'm on my second. Thankfully, um, I've been very fortunate in that. Um, uh, in the years I've been writing now, I've only had two laptops and they both have been really good and really durable. So I'm thankful for that. Um, and like Melissa said, um, we met on Jerry's writing writers guild. And if you guys ever get a chance to join that, even if you can only join it for a little while, it is worth every penny. The, the advice he gives is just fantastic. Um, I like what Sally put in the chat. She put, she had a crawfish. Sally, why don't you come on and tell us about your crawfish? We'd love to hear about it. If you can. <laughs> <laughs> she said she made that word up. We'll have to pay her for the word. <laughs> right, right. She took her craft room and made it into an office. That's great. I love it. Um, Pam, would you like to share about your writing space journey? Sure. I started seriously writing when I was homeschooling too, Melissa, but what in the beginning you can't, you know, cause you have to, when, and I just had one, I was homeschooling. So, um, once Mary got a little older and then I would do a lesson and then set her on task and at the dining room table. And then right next to the dining room table was our computer desk. So she would do her work and I did my writing. I got more writing done then <laughs> than I kind of do now, but uh, it, you know, like in one sitting um, and that was a big old honking desktop with the big modem, big all like that and couldn't take it anywhere because laptops weren't a thing then. So and I would say that was like, Mm, 1996 or seven somewhere in there 98 and so um it must have been before then because i got the adventures of beatrice picked up in 98 but anyway um that and then and that's where and i would just sit in the dining room that's where our desk was we had a little cottage little cape cod house and um until we moved out here where i am now at my mother-in-law's house we've been here almost nine years and then I sat with it. Somebody gave me a thing to put my laptop on this, like a, one of those things that like breakfast in bed type thing where you sit and, but it was made for a laptop. So it had a space for that and for the mouse. And that's where I wrote out in the other room and, you know, no privacy, everybody's around. And when mom was alive and she would come out and she would forget because she had Alzheimer's. Day. Are you writing? Are you working? I am. And then she'd say, okay, I'll leave you to it. And then she'd go out and then she'd come back in again. Are you writing? Are you working? Over and over and over. <laughs> but I got it done, you know, and laptops are great that way because I have set myself up in surgical waiting rooms <laughs> with my laptop and then writing. Um, I wrote and written on notepads in, in the ER and Anna's hospital room when she used to be in the hospital off and on a lot, not like Jaylee. Jaylee was a lot more, but all the emergency stuff, the trauma unit, all that stuff. Now our little, the little room here's our guest bedroom. So there's a twin bed in here. My mother-in-law's huge computer desk that she had that holds a printer and files and stuff that aren't mine. Um, lots of 
household bill stuff and all like that. And this dinky little closet that kind of is cut off, even though it's not a Cape Cod, somehow the it does this and it's over the basement stairs and there's hardly any room. So all my, look, see, this is on the bed. This was from, well, actually there's Maddie with the last um, bit of tomatoes that we've harvested. We still have, you know, a hundred green ones, but you know, it all sits there on the bed and over by the door because I don't have a place to put it and I'm getting ready for vendor events. And so, but I can close the doors. And I can put music on if I need to, or or my headphones or something like that. I'm super thankful for this spot, no matter how cluttered it is, because I really do work better here. Um, I can Zoom with you all here on Tuesday mornings. I'll do silent scribbling on Tuesday nights through another group I'm in and that we all just get on Zoom and mute, leave the video on. And we write for three hours. We don't talk. We don't, we just write, but we feel like we're together. And if I didn't have that privacy, I think that would be harder. So. Sure. Lap desk. That's what you were trying to think of, what you use to put your computer on or lap. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 La yep. That's it. Yep. Every now and then I have it. Cause I have to go, I have to do stuff in bed. Cause Anna wants to go to bed and it's hard to just sit there with the laptop. So they, it still they, comes in handy. They are so handy. In fact, I had my husband and I had discovered the wonders of lap desks early on because you know mm -hmm. you're holding your lap your laptop on your lap for so long and it doesn't get proper ventilation, so they start to overheat. And then yeah. they learned about the lap desks and those they get some venting on that, and you can keep them a lot stabler. So yeah, we we even got lap desks for our kids during homeschool. <laughs> they were so handy. Anyone else, before we go on to the next question, anyone else want to share the journey of their writing space? Rachel, go ahead. Unmute your mic, sweetie. Okay. Um, well, I started out in my living room um, with a, um, it's like a, it was like a triangle easel, if you will, that could go up and down and tip. Um, and then finally, I said enough of my kids moving in and out and playing musical bedrooms. As soon as I would try and fix something, they would capture it and undo everything. <laughs> so, so finally, I went, okay, that's it. You're done. <laughs> this one's mine. <laughs> so this was my daughter's room, um, two of my daughter's rooms when they were growing up. And it is only, I think, nine by 10. That's pretty small. And it felt very claustrophobic. So I painted the closet doors, the brown holocore closet doors with beach scene to open it up. Um, I have like a striped wallpaper on the bottom and a chair rail and white walls. So it makes it seem really bright <laughs> and airy. Um, one thing that helps me if you're able to, if you have a choice, because I had a choice of rooms to capture um, is this one has North light. It faced east, so it's, you know, it's got the morning sun, and then it's got the north window over here. So it's pretty much bright all the time, even on a dark day. Um, had I chosen the back bedroom, it would have been especially hot in the afternoons because it would have gotten the afternoon sun, and I wouldn't have had the, you know, a window beside me with the north light. I situate my desk with the windows beside me because when I had my, I got tired of flipping this around so you'd have the background, the desk, rotating it. And anyway, when I face the window, the laptop blocked half the window, my view. So this way I can look out that way and this way, and that helps me tremendously. I need the light. Um, I have um, residual carpal tunnel and a pinched nerve in my neck um, from a car accident. It goes all the way down. And so I have to have my laptops at an angle. So I have a stand. Norma, you have the better one. You should put that in the chat because I really like yours. Um, so my stand, my laptop sits on makes it so I can pull my laptop to the very edge of my desk so that I'm not bending my wrists and I'm not resting my wrists on the edge of anything because that'll set it off. Um, that's huge and I can adjust it. You know, I can raise it. I'm using my iPad for you guys. I can raise it up and down. So that was kind of a game changer. And also, um, for my iPad, well, actually, it works on a laptop, a phone, an iPad, 
I have a little, somebody here ordered, was it someone here that ordered one? Um, it's a little metal folding stand. It folds up into a pouch about this big, a little velvet pouch. It weighs nothing, it's aluminum, so total ventilation. And it literally will hold my laptop or my phone on it. And it adjusts to several heights. Um, that's huge. And it fits in my pocketbook. So I use that when I'm traveling. So wherever I go, and as far as writing spaces, when it's had it been nice today and we didn't have a bed appointment after this for my dog, I would have been somewhere for you guys. But um, I do go and write at the beach when I can on a picnic table. Um, also the harbor, if you have any such thing near you, the harbor, um, the harbor master actually gave me their password. So I don't have to use a regular public password so I have a better Wi-Fi. So, and there they have tables and chairs and umbrellas set up out there. So that has a nice view. So it gives me a break. And um, for working outside, there are, there are things you can buy. Some of them had reviews that their laptop was blown away because the air caught it and took the whole shebang. Because you can't just work on, you know, out in the sun with your device. So I got a $5 box, like the cardboard fabric covered boxes that collapse. I got that, I cut the lid off and I turn it on its side so it's open toward me. And then I use the lid to the, the lid and the base you would normally put on the bottom to stabilize it. I use that on the sides to hold, to hold it up, to stiffen it. And I stick my laptop or iPad in there and I'm able to work at the beach or wherever else, which we all need some vitamin D <laughs> mentally and physically. And um, sometimes it opens conversations when you're out there writing in public. So you have your mobile office. And so always have your business cards on file, maybe a gospel track to hand out. <laughs> so anyway, so thank you. Let me share. Thank you I for wish, sharing that. I wish I had an, not an outside place like that, but like I wish there was a decent coffee shop around here or something where I could be author in resident. You know, we don't have anything like that in my area. I keep waiting for somebody to open one yeah. for me so I could sit because yeah. I write better. I don't have to have quiet. I like the noise. I like the people. I like the action and all because, you know, I'm like, that's the extrovert in me. And, and then it and it helps me. It helps me focus. It's so weird. And I love it right starbucks all the time if you we don't have one we don't have one. i'm out in the country here and when i go into town there's not the, the towns on either side of me are well they're low income there's not a lot you know there's just nothing like that around me okay. what about your library that's not I mean, nice I have enough there's not people <laughs> clinking glasses and talking and laughing around and music and things. That's it's weird. Isn't that weird? But that helps me. I love that. So oh. it's funny how certain sounds help people to write and how that varies from person to person. One person likes to have music and another needs quiet. Yeah. You know, like the coffee shop environment. Rachel loves that sound of the water and the movement from mm -hmm. the water and, and probably birds in the air. And I write really well at the racetrack where it's so noisy, you can't hear a thing. You got these engines roaring by all the time. It's just interesting. Yeah, it's all energizing, this, that stuff. Environment mm -hmm. is as much about writing as the writing space in a desk. It really is. As far as hemming myself in to get something done, that's, you know, I can think of one piece in particular. Um, one time we were, we had to go, we had to drive a few hours away to pick someone up. And I said to my husband, I'm sitting in the back and I printed the mess that needed to become an article, several pages of it. And I taped it all over the back, all, all over the back of the seat. And I sat in the back of the car and I said, okay, Rachel, you're going to get this done by the time we get there. And I did. So just if that helps anyone sometimes where you just need to finish something that's in pieces that you've been putting off forever, that, that gave me a real goal to get it done. That's a great idea if you're traveling um, and you don't get car sick. Um, sitting in the back, looking at papers, you know what? Oh, no. I would probably get car sick. I couldn't do it. But um, sometimes if I just hold it, 
like in a notebook where it's right here. And, you know, I'm not seeing my peripheral going past the pages and seeing the road and all that. I'm, I'm okay. But that is a great, great idea, Rachel. And, um, you know, when you know you're going to be in the car for a while or go ahead and open up on your laptop, your Word documents and uh, that you want to work on. And there's a, in Word, there's a way to mark working offline so that you can still work on your document. That is great. I love that idea. And that was my next question. I was going to, anybody else want to comment about their work workplace, how it's changed before we move on? Um, and now by saying that, I just interrupted myself and forgot my next question. So mm -hmm. anyway, uh, um, you young people don't get old. Just, just don't, it's not worth it. Um, but anyway, so that now I remember my question. Do you prefer, let's talk for a minute in your office. Do you listen to music? Do you need it absolutely quiet? Do you need background noise? Um, and, but let's frame it this way. In your, in your utopia, what would your perfect office sound like? Melissa, let's start with you this time. Oh, well, if, if I could have my utopia, of course, I'm going to have to have, you know, that dream house with the, the perfect <laughs> cottage, you know, and the the lead diamond glass lined, you know, windows and you can hear nature and birds and everything in a forest outside. But, you know, we're I'm digressing into fantasy. So... <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I do love the sound of, of nature and it and that you know side trail here I am on a rabbit trail again but um one of the things that I do like to do when I need a little inspirational boost is actually just to take a notebook or something and go out on kind of like a nature walk and just find a nice place outside to sit and just write and think and and let the brain relax a bit but um when it comes down to just my actual writing space, I tend to prefer quiet. I like to just let my, my brain focus on it because I have ADD. And so it's very easy for me to be distracted. I'm either hyper distracted or hyper focused. And so music for the most part is a distraction unless I'm just really in a fog and I need something to get me going. And then I will do like um, themed uh, instrumental music. So, of course, I like to listen to, you know, Irish or Scottish, you know, um, instrumental music to inspire me for my historical fiction, something preferably with harps and pipes and all that fun jazz. But uh, I will also do soundtracks to movies sometimes, too. But yeah, that's that's me in a nutshell. Brandy, how about you and your utopia slash fantasy world? Um, what would your sounds, the sounds of your office be? Well, I think probably the very first thing that comes to mind is what the sounds of my office would not be. And that would be the stupid yapper all the time. That's what I call the TV. I really hate the TV in the background. And let me tell you, I have family that just, they come home and that TV is on whenever they're home and it's on, even if they're not sitting there watching and it drives me nuts. I have a TV that's down here underneath a table and my daughter will often sit there and turn it on. And she'll sometimes just have it with no sound and she'll watch cooking shows and whatever. But even then it's still like in my peripheral. So I'm like, Nyeh. and my head keeps going. Nyeh. So <laughs> there's sometimes just like, no, leave it off leave it off because that's the very first thing is that I don't want the sounds of television filtering in now because I often have that I like to put on music to filter that out and so oh this is so funny um a couple weeks ago I was like hmm, I'm just going to turn on classical music on the radio I have a radio behind me that I rarely use I'm like I have a radio why don't I just put that on I know where the classical stations I turned it on and my youngest comes in, she goes, why are you playing cartoon music? <laughs> I'm like, oh, cartoon music. That's what she thinks classical music is. Okay, well, I can see that, but it was just so funny. <laughs> but I found that when I put that on, 
I was able to, it's just, it was just, it was relaxing, just relaxing. And I think some of it is because it reminds me of, um, well, hello, Kitty. Some of it reminds me of um, my grandfather. He used to play a lot of classical music um, and I would spend a lot of time over there with him. Um, but, you know, I also happened to look up at the same time music because I, I was just getting so frustrated with the TV. And I found an article that's, that talked about how different types of music actually boost your creativity over uh, creativity and productivity over playing nothing at all. And there were some scientific studies done on that. And so there was um, different types. There's, you know, classical, and then there was, um, you know, they had just regular popular music. And I was really surprised that at, at the data behind um, all of the research that was done, that you actually get more done by playing music. So I'm like, okay, because my first thought is that after everybody goes to bed, usually that's when I sit there and, and try and work on my own stories. Um, and usually I don't have anything on because I'm concerned about the sound disturbing other people that are trying to sleep. And I can zone into my stories when there's no sound. But I really like the idea of better productivity and the stimulation of the brain with the music. So I'm like, hmm, if I'm concerned about that, I can put in earbuds and maybe try that. So, you know, I do put in a variety of different music sometimes to work because I want to be able to get into that. Now, I have noticed that if I play music that I know too well, sometimes I will slow down my work because even if there's no words, I am singing the tune. Um, and then other times I'll just be sitting there and I'll be going along and I'll be doing this and I'll be doing this. And so sometimes it's kind of like a exercise and workout with the brain and writing. So, you know, different types of music um, work. There are some, some songs that I can listen to. Um, there are a couple of different artists that even though there are lyrics, I can still write to it um, for whatever reason. I think it's the different type of music. It's more, um, I tend to listen to Dead Can Dance. It's kind of strange and weird. If you ever look it up and you'll be like, wow, she's a nutcase. But <laughs> it's something that um, I can play in the background and my mind receives that as a background noise um, and just frees me to be able to create. So there's just certain artists like that. Um, two, Steps from, um, two Steps from Hell is another one. They often play movie scores. Um, they have some fantastic, really moving music. And I've actually played a couple of those uh, their pieces when we've done uh, some of the cover love with us. Two, love two steps from hell. Yeah, yeah, they're great. Um, so yeah, okay, that was a really long winded answer, but <laughs> so I do like quiet, but I'm actually trying to use music more because of that supposed stimulation, and sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. So I think it depends on my state of mind, but yeah. Hearing everybody talk about the music, Brandy, reminded me of the time you did a Come Right With Us um, geared around different kinds of music. Um, sorry, I'm trying to type in, right? Because I sent out an answer and sent it to one person and said, everybody, the name of the group, the person or the group is Two Steps From Hell. Is that what you said? Yep. Yep. Um, but anyway, I, I digress. Um, I would love for us, Brandy, maybe sometime in the future to do the uh, another come right with us with music, because the one I'm remembering is where you had different kinds of music and you gave us a few minutes as you played it to write whatever that music, whatever that sound moved in us. And that was extremely um interesting and educational because I never knew of such a thing. Um, for me, I tend to have uh, some ADD. Um, my, if you ask my kids, they would say there's no tend about it. I do. Um, but most of the time, uh, I like what Sally said when she's doing nonfiction, she needs it quiet. And that's most of what I write is nonfiction. I've kind of set my fiction to the side for a little bit, but hoping to get back into it. Um, and so I need quiet because I just need to mull these things over and I need to talk to God about how, you know, what verse goes with what and what he wants me to say and all those 
all those great things. And um, I, our kids, when we were home, I'm another homeschool mom. And uh, I think there's quite a few of us here. And um, my kids listen to classical music a lot through the years. And so a lot of it, I kind of know. And I have a tendency as soon as I hear something, I'm off either humming it or just kind of find myself just checking out. And so, you know, when we're writing, checking out, it's not always the best thing. So I choose to write in quiet. Um, I would love to be able to, well, now that I have my own office, I don't really need to, but I love the idea of going to a coffee shop. It just sounds so, um, I don't know, professional, movie star-like, whatever, you know, you sit in a coffee shop and you write, right? How many movies have that? That's almost cliche, right? Um, but along with my ADD, um, my brain does not register background noise. And so everything is foreground. I hear everything that all the tables around me are talking about. I hear the machines going off. I hear the AC going off. I, my brain registers it all right here, front and center. So in reality, even as romantic as writing in a coffee shop sounds, it just wouldn't really work for me. Um, so I come in my office and I close the door. And usually once my office doors close, my husband and my son know don't, don't enter without tap, tap, tap. Is it okay to come in? <laughs> so not that I lose my mind or anything, because I don't, but it's just they get that unhappy face when I'm right in the middle of something and, you know, that uh, train of thought is broken. And then where do you go from there? So, but in my utopia, I would be sitting in front of a big um, bay window, looking across the mountains on one side and the ocean on the other, because I like both worlds. Um, and I would have windows open and, and just hear nature. Um, that would be my perfect writing place. Anybody else want to comment on, in your utopia, what would your perfect writing place be like? Pam, go ahead. I know what everybody said. I think it depends on what you're writing and what you need at the time. Um, there are times when I can write away and I'm okay with no music but I can focus better with a little bit of small something. I think part of that is that tinnitus I've got in it so loud some days that I can't focus because it gets so loud. It hurts. It's literally painful. And to the point where I just want to put my head through the wall to make it stop. So sometimes I'll put on that video. YouTube has different videos that helps tone that down. Sometimes that helps. And then sometimes just the music. So I yeah, can relate to the tinnitus. Yeah, and I actually learned going to the doctor that it's tinnitus. Well, um, actually, depends on the doctor. It depends on who is saying it. Right, tinnitus, tinnitus. Like, it, yeah. Oh, yeah. and I'm like anything with itis is always itis. But even when I looked it up on Google, you know, how do you pronounce this? All the different versions I looked at. But anyway, it's whatever. Just, but we all know what tinnitus is. Right. It's yeah. rough. Yeah. It is, it's, it is rough. And they determined mine was from <laughs> stress. <laughs> oh, who could imagine such a thing? <laughs> it it came on all of a sudden and, um, February, November, December, January, four months after my dad passed away. So I've been, and I couldn't even hold my head up. It was like this. Cause it just, it was really bad, really bad. I almost told my husband, take me to the ER. Something's wrong with me. Cause I had never had anything like that. It's, yeah. Good days, bad days, like everything, right? Um, Leslie said she loves to go to Panera, um, but often it's too distracting, but she'll try to wear earbuds and play soft music. Um, but she does that mostly. Um, she does research when she's there. Um, let's see. Yeah, the last time I went, <laughs> I, I thought it was going to be quiet. We have two. One is like super, super busy gets all the the um, people that are meeting for business meetings or whatever. And so it can be very loud and distracting. The other one is more calm, but then you get a lot of the senior citizens that like to talk and that's their, their social event for the week. So 
the one day that I went, there was all of these seniors and I'm like, is it senior day? And I didn't know it. Um, and I just, I was distracted because I was happy to be there, happy to be out of the house because I don't get out of the house much. Um, but when I was there and then there was all these, you know, seniors and they were talking and, and then the, the call out for, you know, the food, food, food orders were getting called out too. And then the music they had on was really weird. And I'm like, okay, I'm just going to put my earbuds on and I'll be here, but yet I'm not here. So it, my earbuds helped me zone out of the noise a little bit. And I still was able to get a lot of research done. And ironically, it was one of my better research days. So I think changing up your location really, really helps with um, getting something done that you may not have gotten done otherwise. It, it might be the the environment. It might be, you know, the change in your in your mood or something because you're in a different place. But um, my ideal place, I think, would be <laughs> just uh, a, a nice little cottage out in the woods and have a, like a little river stream. And I could sit there maybe on a back porch and still hear the stream, um, but not be interrupted by everything else. I, I need that peace, that calm. So when I want to go outside and like uh, Rachel said, you can't always see your devices. Um, I like to be in my backyard but then we have these people that have these cars that our street is a is a middle street of a roundabout so everybody uses our street to go cut through and so then you're hearing a lot of cars and then that gets distracting so um i like to be able to be near the window uh in my dining room it's become my my place instead of being in my croft room <laughs> um and i um my craft room is, is like Rachel's it's really small it's like a nine by ten it's the smallest bedroom in the house I stuffed all of my uh, craft supplies in there and then there's no room to write and the window sits up high because we have a ranch home so it, it sits up high and I can't really see the window so I like to come to the dining room and I'm lucky to have um, win um, windows that have marble window sills on them so I can have all of my plants I love plants that bloom especially in the middle of the winter we get crucial brutal winters here in PA <laughs> so it could be snowing outside and I'll have orchids or something blooming inside so it's kind of like a mental therapy thing too so I can sit by my window and play some of the the, the links that I gave you on YouTube and just have that calm outdoor feel um, but not really be out there so great I, I love what Sally put she put I'll put on 80s alternative music because it tunes out the other amb ambient noises and I've heard it all a thousand times. So basically I tune it out. Um, see, when I've heard it a thousand times, I know it and I want to sing along. So you're stronger than I am, Sally. Good for you. Rachel, you had your hand up. Go ahead. Okay. Ideal place. All glass. 360, 360 glass, <laughs> ocean pounding on the rocks and lapping on the shores and the breeze rustling the leaves of the trees as they brush against the shutters. <laughs> that would be, and maybe a little quiet babbling brook too. And there, there is such a place in Jamaica, actually. I could even have the mountains behind me. Um, but then back to reality, right? Um, okay. I find that sometimes it's hard for me to settle and get in my zone, especially if depending on what has preceded me being able to sit down. And so when I'm smart, which isn't often enough, um, I will sometimes turn on music before I start writing, even if I don't keep it on. It helps transition me into like a amount of being still, if you will, right? And um, sort of get me in the zone. And like you've said, sometimes, you know, movie score music, depending on what I'm writing, um, Christian inspirational, um, just um, instrumental um, sometimes. Most of the times I, I'm fine with Christian music um, because there's this, a spirit with it, which brings a peace, you know, a certain presence of God with it that helps me. Um, I do wish sometimes that they would change it up because I keep hitting skip, skip, skip. <laughs> but, um, but it depends because uh, um, I get to a point sometimes in a piece where I need dead silence. And I've said this before, where even the AC will drive me crazy. I want to throw it across the room. And so what I do for the AC issue in the summer is I will close my office door, turn the AC up, get it cold. And then 
I have the AC on at the end of the hall, the bedroom that's right down the hall on. So then I turn off the AC in my room, open that door and it keeps it livable without the noise in my head of the AC. I'm sorry, that is not white noise to me. That's crazy noise. <laughs> so um, other things to help, by the way, for anyone this helps, something that doesn't need a plug. I just got this. It's, um, you put your essential oils in it. It does not need to be plugged in. It's very simple and it, it does help the space. And so I do things like lemongrass and orange and then low notes of frankincense and maybe a touch of eucalyptus or peppermint just to try and balance the, um, the warm with the more energetic, you know, like citrusy stuff. And that helps me. Um, so anyway, um, I just, and sometimes I just need headspace and I need to, and I don't take it enough to go take a walk and then I'm able to write or just go sit on the ocean and just listen, not try to write, just be. And then what do you know? Suddenly God speaks to you. So anyway, just my two cents. Sometimes I find when, uh, Rachel, you had mentioned or somebody mentioned, sometimes we just need a break um, and we feel like maybe we're not doing anything. But often what happens is our subconscious is chewing on whatever it is that we're working on and it's or I think was it Jerry Jenkins somebody said it it was percolate yeah some of you are old enough to remember the old coffee percolators right no, um, you still use them it's the way to make proper coffee right but uh anyway so sometimes when you feel like you're not um progressing the way you want to um, you never know what's going on back there, back in your subconscious back here. It's just working away the little computer that it is. It's hashing out and thinking about and joining and connecting all the things. And at some point you'll sit down and that idea will just come to the front and you go, oh, well, thanks, God. That was great. Um, there's, another, excuse me, there's another space, a very important space in my life that helps me write. The space, one of the names for it is called Norma Poor. <laughs> because sometimes I need to vocalize. Sometimes it's not even, sometimes I need someone to say, help me figure this out. But sometimes I just need to talk to someone about it. And as I talk, I can see it better. It like untangles. And sometimes so we you. do. You're welcome. <laughs> sometimes we need a writing buddy that we can just bounce ideas off of which is, you know, great. And I know Brandy does that from time to time. They have a brainstorming session on her, on our writer's chat fiction um, that meets on, you officially meet the second Friday. Um, do you meet most Fridays, but what's your official? We, yeah, we, <clears throat> we, well, we have writer's chat fiction. It's a, a, a dedicated group for fiction. It's small. Um, and that's, we we meet every Friday, um, unless something comes up. But we have dedicated. Thanks, Kat. We have a dedicated um, uh, day that we do like an organized, a regular monthly meeting. That's usually the second of the month, and then the other days are write-ins or chat and things like that. And support. We do support. Yeah. Well, this has been. Fantastic. And um, Melissa included in the link, if you want to be sure to save the chat, 16 stimulating workplaces of famous authors. And if you ever have the chance to go to Write to Publish, which is in uh, Wheaton College in Wheaton, Illinois, they have a writing museum there. And it has the desk of C.S. Lewis and, and Tolkien and um, a few other famous authors that I can't remember right off the top of my head, um, but uh, it was really neat to see where they worked and their desks really weren't super big. They were, they were kind of small and, but it was neat to, to just touch and see where some of my favorite authors wrote. So that was pretty cool. That was pretty cool. Well, I want to say thank you for joining me. You all have made um, our discussion lively and wonderful, and I appreciate you 
um, coming on, whether it's just by voice or by text or by video. Thank you for being here today. And Melissa, do you know what we have coming up next? Yes, next week we're going to have Bethany Jett join us to talk about uh, life and the, the agent's journey, basically telling us how things are for her now as a literary agent and, and all the stuff she's learning. So it'll be fun to, to get the inside scoop there and, and get a different perspective again. So we hope you'll be able to join us then. And if not, well, you can always catch the replays on Series Writers YouTube channel too. So yeah, I think Great. that's everything. I I guess we'll see you all next week then. Have a blessed week. Bye now.